Worship God for a while.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Becky. I am one of the worship leaders here. We are so happy to have each and every one of you with us today. If this is your first time here, we'd like to send you a free gift. All you have to do is text the number on the screen. If you're watching online, it's the number below me right now. Just text that number. We will send you a gift card. No strings attached. No weird visits. None of that craziness. Uh, we would just love for you to know that we are happy that you are here today. We're going to sing a couple more songs now. So if you want to jump back up on your feet, uh, we are going to move on. is built on your faithfulness. My hope is held in your promises. I take each step with your confidence, because I am yours. I am yours. You never fail. Hey, 
every day. We pray, God, that you will guide Aaron as he brings a message to us and help us to all learn how it is so important that we love our neighbor. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Holding on to faith Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it You make us You make giants fall you use songs of praise to shake prison walls. I will speak to my fear. I will speak to my doubt that you were faithful then. You'll be faithful now. Oh, you are Standing on your word, calling heaven down to earth, and you will fight my enemies. This will end in victory, but I will believe it. Yes, I will believe it. You make mountains move, you make giants fall. Thank you. 
good morning and happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. We are so glad that you guys would join us this morning. Make sure you dads, you guys get your biscuits before you leave, all right? We got bacon and we got sausage, all right? So make sure you get it. And uh, if your kid steals one on the way out, we don't mind that either, all right? I think all three of mine have already stolen a biscuit this morning. So uh, please, we don't like leftovers in here. So make sure you guys take all that when you leave and uh, enjoy it. And uh, we hope you guys have an awesome Father's Day. We are continuing our series this morning on how to neighbor, the art of neighboring. What does it truly mean for us to love God and love our neighbor? And we've been going, I believe this is week four now, and we've been trying to understand that even though many of us use this language, even though many of us say these words, what does that actually look like? It's very simple, but not so simple. And so we have been able to take the last few weeks and find practical ways that we can start to do that. And so this morning, as we're talking about this idea of loving our neighbor, I want to talk a little bit about what it truly means to build a community, what it truly means to start building a community with the people that are around you, and not so much look at it like it is a compound. Uh, and before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, when I was in college, uh, I went off to Cedarville for college, and um, the dorms, when we first, uh, I, was, I was mentioned in the first service, Jimmy was here in the first service. We went to college together at Cedarville and we stayed in the same dorm. We were in the same room and they had us in units. And uh, the, the, we were in the freshman dorms at Cedarville. And just with any other, just like any other college, your freshman dorms are also your smaller ones and a little more compact. Well, these things were very, very small. The units were incredibly small, actually. And, um, they, uh, they basically had two rooms up front, two rooms in the back, two students per room. And then, then you had like a joining bathroom. And then on the other side was the same exact thing. And those were your units. It was like had different numbers and stuff like that. And so you were putting units with different people. And it was always funny to me. They had this little area and they called it the lounge. All right. They called it the lounge. But literally all it was was this little opening in the hallway with a closet that had like a vacuum cleaner in it. And that was supposed to be your lounge. So we would always, you know, we tried to make it the best lounge that we could. So we always had like folding chairs and stuff and people would sit there. Well, when we first got there, I remember the, the first like week we were there. It was a lot. It was really, really awkward. You're, you're with people you don't know. You're with people from different walks of life. I mean, this happens in every college, but also um, you got to think this is Cedarville and, and Cedarville, uh, it is, it is full, and I mean full, of a lot of homeschool kids. And I'm not saying anything bad about homeschool kids, but everyone is just raised differently, right? So it was always this weird, like, we don't know each other. We don't know how, to, like, it's going to be strange, right? So I remember a lot of times, Jimmy and I, we had our door closed, and we just kept to ourselves. And um, what ended up happening from the different people that we were in these this unit with, by the end of the semester, actually even more, uh, by that by the end of the semester, uh, and towards the end of the school year itself, these people that we just considered acquaintances, these people that we were just considering, people that we had to stay in a dorm with, they actually became our best friends. They became, we became very, very close. And it, it was so awesome to be able to develop relationships with these people. And why did it happen? For the simple fact that we had to look at each other every single day. There was nowhere else to go. I mean, this place was so small. We joke all the time that the bathrooms were small. The shower stalls were small. Like, I'm not kidding. I mean, I was a little guy, so it wasn't that big of an issue for me. But if you were a little larger than me, I mean, you literally could have just lathered up the walls with soap and then just gone like this. And that's about the only way you could get yourself totally clean because there ain't no leaning down in these things. I mean, it was bad. It was really, really small. But we ended up becoming best friends for the simple fact that we were around each other. Now, we could have kept to ourselves. We could have told ourselves we were just going to do our schoolwork. We were just going to go back to our room, and that's going to be the end of it. But instead, we started to get to know these people. And by the be beginning, we were all keeping our doors closed and keeping to ourselves. By the end, the only time you ever closed your door was to go to bed. The door stayed open all the time. All the different dorms stayed open. Why? Because instead of it becoming just my little individual room and their individual room, it became a community. It became a place that we could call home away from home. And we were able to do that because we were able to build community. 
And now as I'm an adult, and now as I'm truly uh, in a neighborhood, and I'm living around other people, I have to ask myself, am I doing the same thing that I started doing all those years ago at Cedarville? Am Am I keeping myself closed off? Am I closing my door as quickly as I can behind me and staying away from the people who live the closest to me? And I would say to that that, yeah, I've done that many, many times. And And I think if we all look at our lives, maybe we do that. And so this morning, I want to take it even a step further. We're not just going to talk about loving those people that are around us, but we're going to talk about those people that maybe when we try to like them or love them or care for them, maybe they don't feel the same way towards us. And we're going to see what Jesus has to say about that. And what does it truly mean to go from living this life where we're living in a compound and we're going to building a true community in our area. I want you to see what Jesus has to say about this. He's talking in Luke chapter 6. Now, he's gone through, uh, um, in this passage, he's actually already gone through the idea of what it truly means for what will happen in the next life. These people who you're talking to, they've gone through struggles, they've gone through sorrow, they've gone through a lot of different issues. He's talking to a lot of uh, Jewish people, he's talking to even some of the, the teachers of the law, but he's also talking to some people who are on the outside, the the the, the uh, the people that, w- that would be the throwaways, they're kind of to the side. And then there's also people over here who would say that, you know, they're, they're trying to follow the rules. They're trying to do the right thing. So as he's speaking this, he starts talking about the idea of, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the people who hunger. Blessed are the people um, who thirst. And, and what it truly means, what it's going to mean for the next life. And then Jesus gets to this passage, and as he's encouraging, he says this to the people who are kind of in the back, and they're kind of just taking everything in. Here's what Jesus has to say. Verse 27 of Luke chapter 6. He says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from who you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Let me say that one more time. He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Verse 36. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So as Jesus is sharing this, he brings up the idea of enemies. He brings up the idea of those who maybe uh, uh, don't get uh, uh, much love, the people who we like to talk about, the people that we have problems with, the people that we get angry and frustrated about. Jesus starts bringing these people to the limelight, and he shows them how they are to be treated. And Jesus says something that is absolutely radical, outside of the box, completely ridiculous. He tells these people that they are to love their enemies. And if anyone takes from them, they're supposed to give them even more. If someone slaps them in the cheek, they're supposed to turn the other cheek and give them the other one. If they, if they take their coat here, you can have the shirt also. You're supposed to go above and beyond and not for just people that you know, but for people who do not like you for your enemies. You see, you got to see who he's talking to right here. He's talking to these Jewish people who are dealing with the Roman government, people who want them eradicated, people who want them gone, who care nothing about them, who are oppressing them, who are going through horrible, horrible situations. And they want any, the one thing they want more than anything is they want to be liberated from this. They believe Jesus is coming to get them out. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. He's going to take the seat. He's going to take the throne and he's going to throw over everything and he's going to become the king. That's what they think is going to happen. And yet Jesus says right here, the people that you think I'm going to take over, you're supposed to love them. You're supposed to care for them. You're supposed to pray for them. You're supposed to give to them and not expect anything back. Because why? Because God loves the wicked and the ungrateful. 
This is something we don't like to talk too much about. This is something we don't get very excited about. Now, you and I will sit here and say, oh, God, he saved a sinner, a wretch like me. Thank God he loved me. But it says that he actually died and gave mercy to the wicked and the ungrateful. He is kind to those people. This is a wild, radical idea that Jesus has this. So what is this? What is Jesus trying to show us in this passage? Why would he bring this up in this moment? I believe there's a couple reasons why he does it. What's it say in verse 31? This sums it up. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the golden rule, right? How many of y'all learned this when you were in school? Anybody learned this when you were in school? Guess what? A lot of people don't know it comes from the Bible. They just believe it's a general nice idea, right? Because I think everyone would agree. Yeah, that's a pretty good general thought. I like that. I think everyone should do that. But that's Jesus' words. Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do to you. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This sums up everything. Because when it comes down to it, and we've spoken about it before, what is sin? What truly is sin? Sin is wanting to be God. Sin is wanting to be the center of attention. Sin is wanting to be the one who makes up the rules. Sin is wanting to be the absolute center of the universe. Everything revolves around me. All my emotions, my decisions, my, my rules, everything must go by me. Me, me, me. Everything is about me. And so what we end up doing, Jesus says, okay, so then I know that's your problem. Your sin problem is you want to be God. You want to make everything up. So what you need to be able to do is treat other people the way that you want to be treated by other people. So you want people to be nice to you. You want people to take care of you. You want people to be considerate of you. You want people to, to show you mercy, show you grace. Show, that's what you're supposed to do for other people. This is what Jesus shows us is how we are to build community is to start looking at people the way that we're supposed to be treating ourselves. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Why does he want us to do this? He's describing this radical love, but not love for people who love you back, but for those people who don't. So why would we do something like that? Why would we do something so silly? Why would we care about someone who doesn't care about us? Why would we love someone who doesn't love us? Why in the world would we do something that seems so stupid? Jesus says it in the last verse. 36. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. You are to love others because God loved you. You see, when we read about the, kind, the unkind and the ungrateful and the wicked, we like to think of other people, right? We like to think of the other people in our lives who we don't like, who we call our enemies, right? But Jesus is saying, no, 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 you don't get this idea. Listen, if you would understand how wicked and how awful you truly are, you're a nasty person. Yet God showed mercy to you. If you truly start to understand the idea of God's mercy, then you will begin to show it to other people. This is what he calls us to do. That's why he says, love your enemies. Why would he have us do this? Two key points. Here's why I think he has us do this. Because it just seems like a, a crazy idea. I Personally, I told someone out this in the hallway, in between services. I hate this. Personally, I hate this. I don't want to love my enemies. Does anyone here, I love loving my enemies. Anybody at all? Not me. I can't stand this. I really do. Like when it comes up, here's what's great about Jesus. He offends everybody, doesn't he? There is something, I promise you, there is something in God's word. When you read about Jesus that you're going to go, that you don't read everything and go, oh, it's just, listen, that's because of our sinful nature. That's because of who we are. There is something in there that's going to offend you and something that is going to challenge you and something that you need to give God, Right? But he shows it to every single one of us. So understand, when I read this, I'm like, oh, come on. Do I have to do this? Yes. Yes, you do. You have to love your enemies. So two key things I think that it shows us here, right? The first thing is this, is that Jesus clearly is showing us in this, right? That living for God, it absolutely means loving people who often don't love us back. What it means is that we have to love people who often, many, many times, don't love us back. Now, when we talk about enemies, right? For us, many times, it's someone we don't like, someone who doesn't like us back, someone who's annoying, someone who, that person we don't like at work, that person who bugs me at school, that person, this is who we think about, right? But I want you to understand this. 
Maybe some of you out here this morning, maybe you actually have an enemy. I mean, someone who hates you. Someone who would be fine with you not existing. This is who Jesus tells you and I that we are to love. This is tough, guys. This is not easy at all. But look what Jesus says here in Romans chapter 5. Look what it says in Romans chapter 5. It says this, Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, now I want you to see that's important, God's enemies. Too often, here's what we tell, well, I'm just a child of God. I'm just a child of God. Uh, sorry, you're an enemy of God. Because of your sin and because of my sin, we were enemies of God. Our sin separated us from a holy, righteous, perfect God. And because of that, we were enemies of God. Now that word right before it is important. Were God's enemies, okay? So check this out. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? I want you to see right here in this passage that what God is showing, what Paul is writing about in Romans chapter 5 here, is the idea, understanding that you were an enemy of God, but he who is rich in his mercy, which we'll read about later, understanding that he sent his son Jesus to die for his enemy. You see, when I look at my life, I think, well, God died for me, but I, you know, I'm a good boy. I'm a good guy, right? I haven't done anything bad. I haven't cheated on my wife. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't smoke. I don't drink. You, like, I, you can come up with all these dumb things in our minds that we think make us in good standing with God, right? But my sin made me an enemy with God. I was against God. But because of the death of Jesus, I was reconciled. I was given an opportunity to be forgiven by his mercy that he showed to every single one of us. So for me, what I need to be able to do is understand that through his life, looking at the life of Jesus... I am now able to love others just as he loved me. When we recognize that, but what else do we see? He calls you to do just that. He calls us to live a life in his steps, loving people just like he did. Look what it says here in 1 Peter chapter 2. This is the example we're given. To this you were called. That's Christians, all right? That's you and I, those who call themselves Christ followers. You were called because Christ suffered for you. Christ suffered for me, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. He gave us the example. Because Christ died for his enemy, we are able to love our enemies. Do you get this idea? Do you, do you really start? Listen. I know, I know you've heard this before. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm just, I know I'm supposed to love God and love others. But do we really get this concept? I just want you to know that this is a struggle for me too. I am in no way trying to say you guys don't get it, but I get it. I Listen, this is tough. This is a tough reading. This is a tough part of scripture when it tells me to love our enemy. Too often what we do is we go, amen, amen, to the things that we like that Jesus say, says, and then the things that he says that we don't like, we like to just, eh, well, it's all right. I don't need to do that. Yes, yes, you do. Yes, you do. This is what he's called us to do. This is how we go from a compound to a community. This is how we start loving others that are in our area, the people that God has put around us, that God has, that people that are surrounded around us. We have to be able to live like Jesus. The last part of this key point I want you guys to see is that we'll never be asked to show love in a way that Christ has not already shown to us. I want you to know that Christ is never going to call us to a love that he has not shown himself. You see, here's what's great about Jesus. You and I, God calls us to do things and we go, well, God, you, you, you've never experienced that. Yes, he has. He experienced it through Jesus. This was the whole point of Jesus. We understand, he understands the struggles and the pain and the sorrow that we deal with because Jesus dealt with the same thing. Jesus loved his enemies, the people who persecuted him and wanted him dead. He loved them. Guys, he picked Judas as a disciple. He knew that guy was going to turn him in one day. He knew that guy was, was messing with the finances. He knew what he was doing. Yet Jesus loved him. 
Jesus chose him as a disciple. He loved his enemies. He did it. So the question then for us is this. How can we go from having a compound mindset to having a community mindset? How can you go from just living around the people to living with the people God has surrounded you with? And this is huge. This is important. I want to give you just a couple things and then we're going to shut it down. First one is this. How can we have a community mindset? We have to make the focus of our gatherings not about us, but about others. Make it not just about us, but about others. What does that exactly mean? What does that exactly look like? Let me read for you from Philippians chapter 2. Look what it says here in Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. I want you to know this morning that the reason we do so many things is because we make it about ourselves. That's what sin is. We want to put ourselves, number one, we want to put ourselves at the top. We may love others. We may be kind to other people. But at the end of the day, we are going to do what's best for us, right? This is what we do often. But he tells us that when we gather with people, when we reach out to people, we need to be thinking about them, not just ourselves. Now, And I say not just ourselves, because we are important. We are important to God. He wants us to take care of ourselves. He wants us to protect our loved ones. He wants us to protect our family. But he also shows us that we're supposed to bring people into that. We're supposed to live with other people. Think about it. You invite people. Maybe you're having people over your house for Father's Day today. Maybe you're having a cookout or something tonight, right? What would you do with your house? Probably cleaned it. Maybe you didn't, but probably cleaned it. Why did you clean your house? You didn't do it for them. You did it for you, right? We're having people at our house for Father's Day. I'm having next level at my house tonight. We clean the house. Why did we clean the house? Because I don't want people to think that I'm a lazy slop. It's not for you guys. It's for me. I don't, you, I, I am, I don't want you guys to think that I don't take care of my house, right? I got to cut the grass before you guys got there. Why? Because I want you guys to think I cut my grass all the time, Right? This is the whole point. We, we, we're doing it for ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. Cut your grass. Clean your house. Please, do those things. I always laugh so hard. I remember growing up, my mom would be like, we're having guests. Go fix your room. I'd be like, why do I have to clean? They're not going into my room, mom. Why do I have to? Like, people are going to walk, walk in. Oh, how are you doing? Knock on the door. They'll be like, oh, I'm great. Go straight to my room. Bed's not made. Bed's not made. I'm leaving. I was just always like, why, why do I have to clean? My, why do I have to make my bed? They're not going to lay in my bed. Why is this important? Why do we do it? It's for ourselves. It's not a bad thing, but it's and it's a stupid example, but it's true. We're thinking about ourselves. Too often, when we invite people over, we're thinking about: Is this going to be awkward for me? Is this going to be weird for me? What am I? I am too busy. I do not have time. I do not. Me, me, me. Everything is about me. Let's bring people into that. Let's bring people into those situations. Let's start having a mindset of others instead of ourselves. This is what Christ told us to do, right? The other thing I want you guys to see this is to make a commitment never to isolate, never to separate ourselves from others, but to actually serve other people. To start making that commitment to not isolate ourselves from our neighbors, but to find actual, real, tangible ways to serve others. Think about it. How can you do that this week? How can you look at the situation of the people around you and you can actually do something for them? Instead of sitting there going, that person never cuts their grass, why don't you cut their grass for him? If you're sitting there and saying, that dog always poops in my yard, how about cleaning it up and saying, hey, um, do, you, do, you, does, does, do you want me to walk your dog one day for you? I mean, we can think of different ways to do it, and we may think it's silly and stupid, but these are the real ways that we can start serving other people, right? These are the ways that we can actually start thinking of other people. And then the last thing is this. I want you guys to make sure that you are ready and prepared for a long journey. Because when you start showing yourself to other people and you start giving of your time and your efforts and your love to people, especially those people who don't love you back, you're in for a bumpy, wild ride. But look at what we're told to do in Galatians chapter 6. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give 
up. I want you guys to know that what Jesus was talking about here in this passage about loving your neighbors, right before it, what was he talking about? He said, blessed are these people because soon they will have this. Blessed are these people because they will soon have this. Blessed are the hungry, for they will be filled. Blessed are the, th the thirsty, for they shall never thirst. They, they will be quenched. All these different guys, understanding that everything that we're doing is with a kingdom mindset. You may be in a tough spot with someone. You may be trying to love somebody who doesn't love you. You may be trying to show God's mercy to someone who would never show mercy to you. I want you to know that God says we cannot grow weary in doing good for other people because what we are doing right now is going to last in eternity. Understand that it's so important for us to know that we're not just living in a compound. It's truly a commun community. But even more so than a community, here's the outlook we need to have with the people we live around. It's not just a compound. And it's not just a community. But it's truly a launching pad for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means that where I am and with the people that are around me, I have to view it like this is ground zero for the gospel to change the world. All this time, after Jesus is gone, the Holy Spirit comes and the disciples start turning the world upside down. How did they do it? Did they do it by coming to a place together like this? 300 people show up to church and one guy speak and then everybody leaves and goes about their lives? No, they did it in their homes. They did it in their communities. They did it in with the lives of the people that they lived around. This is what we're called to do. We need to look at it not as a compound, not just a place that we go in and out with the people who also go in and out about their everyday life, but we start developing relationships. We start finding real ways that we can serve and love others. Why do we do that? And especially the people who don't love us back, we show love to them. Jesus tells me that I'm not only supposed to just say, Slap me right here, but actually, you know what? Here's my other cheek. You can slap this one too. And then if someone wants to take my coat, say, hey, you can, have the, you can have the shirt as well. We are supposed to go above and beyond. We're not supposed to think of ourselves in vain conceit, but we're actually supposed to put others above ourselves. Why would we have this radical thought? Why would we do this? Because of this. Look what it says here in Ephesians chapter 2. All of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy. We were in the same boat. We were in the same position. We were in the same standing as everyone else. And God's wrath was on us. But God, who is rich in mercy, showed himself to us through his son, Jesus. I want you to know this morning that in order for us to move from just a compound mindset to truly to a community mindset, we have to view others the way that God viewed us. Someone who is in need of mercy. When we start doing that, the good news of the gospel can start changing lives. Would you guys bow your heads with me really quick this morning? Two simple things and we're going to move on. This morning I want to ask you if, if, um, if you need to be challenged this morning with this idea. I want you to know that God wants us all to start loving others in order that we may love him more. And that may be tough. That may be uh tougher than we think. It can be difficult. But this is the challenge God has for every one of us and myself included. So this morning, I want to give you the opportunity. I want you to think about that person in your life. Maybe you don't get along with them. Maybe you clash with them. Maybe you would refer to them as your enemy. How can you love them this week? How can you show them mercy in the same way God showed you mercy? What's that real, tangible way that you can show them that you love God and you love them? 
I want to ask if there's anybody else this morning, maybe you don't know Jesus and, and you recognize this morning as you heard the message that you are separated from him because of your sin. You don't have Christ who changes us. And maybe you need to give your life to him. I'm going to ask you this morning, if that's you and you say, I, 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 need, I, I need to give my life to him because I want to be changed. If you want that this morning, all you have to simply do is speak out to him, talk to him, pray to him. And you can pray something simply as this. Now, it's not these words. It's not these special words put together that somehow magically saves you. It's trusting in the one who gave his life for you. If you want that this morning, right there where you're sitting, you can pray something. If you're watching online this morning, you can pray this right there where you're sitting watching this. You can pray something like this. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed up. I know that I've not done everything right. But I know now that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. I know that you sent your son Jesus so that I could be forgiven. And I'm asking for that now. I, I'm, I'm repenting. I'm, I'm leaving that stuff behind. I want to ask for forgiveness and I want my life to be changed. I thank you so much for loving for me. Thank you so much for dying for me. I want to live my life for you now. Really quick this morning, if, if there's anybody with the heads still bowed and the eyes still closed, if there's someone this morning, you're like, Aaron, I just want to let you know I said that prayer, I believed that prayer, and I gave my life to Jesus. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to bring you up here on stage or anything like that, but I do want to celebrate with you because that's something you need to let people know. If there's anybody this morning that says, I gave my life to Jesus, and I just want to let you know, would you please just put your hand up, put it right back down for me really quick. Anybody this morning say, I gave my life to Jesus this morning. Anybody this morning? Awesome. Let's pray together. God, you call us to love our enemies. I get really uncomfortable with that. But I have to remember, God, that I was your enemy. But you sent Jesus in your mercy for me. Help us all to remember that this morning. Help us to treat others the way we want to be treated because you gave your life for us. We love you so much. We thank you. We praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And amen. God, guys, we want to thank you so much for being here today. We hope